Thank you. Hello, everybody in the room and out there. Um, welcome. Happy Halloween. My name is Liz Crocker, and I'm on the learning team here at the Royal BC Museum. And you have joined us for Creep, Crawl, Slither on Halloween, and we're so glad that you did. I'm going to get uh, Jenny to share the share the slides. We've got a couple slides before we get to meet our biologists that we're here with today. So Creep, Crawl, Smither, Slither. We're going to be here together about 45 minutes today. Um, next slide, Jenny. And uh, we are joining you here today um, on the territory of the Lekwungen speaking people. That's the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nation. And we're here at the southern tip of Vancouver Island <clears throat> in Victoria, BC. And we're very grateful to be on the territory of, be able to work here on the territory of the Lekwungen speaking people. Next slide, Jenny. So just in case you are not from around here, there's a, our beautiful map of Canada. We're way on the west coast, way down on the southern tip right on Vancouver Island, southern tip of Vancouver Island in the capital of our province of British Columbia. And there's a close up of the island. Thank you very much, Jenny. And then, yeah, we have a photo of, so our, this is our museum if you've never been here before. And we are actually in the tower on the right. We're in Fannin Tower. And um, I learned a Lekwungen word recently from an exhibit we had here at the museum called Sacred Journeys. And the word is wasikum, wasikum. And it means place of mud, which is where the inner harbor, where the museum is almost exactly on the inner harbor in Lekwungen is known as wasikum. So go ahead and write in the chat if you like. If you know what territory you are on, please share that with us. We would love to hear that. Um, and so without further ado, I think we'll stop. Oh, no, good, Jenny, excellent. <laughs> These are the folks that you're gonna actually meet in person in a minute. We've got Dr. Gavin Hanke, uh, first up with vertebrate zoology and uh, Dr. Joel Gibson, who's gonna be with us about entomology. So, um, and then just, we will show that slide again at the end, just in case you need to, email them with a pressing question about the animals we're going to talk about today, which are animals that creep, crawl, and slither. So without further ado, I'm going to flip the camera over and we have Dr. Gavin Hanke and I'll let Gavin introduce himself more, but in a sort of more robust way than I did and I'll let you take it away. <laughs> uh, I'm the vertebrate zoologist here at the Royal BC Museum. I've been here since 2004, so that's a long time. Uh, I basically cover birds, mammals, fish, amphibians, and reptiles, but today we're going to focus on amphibians and reptiles because they're generally things people think about around Halloween. Eye of Newt, toads generally <laughs> get associated with witches, but most people, if they think creepy or they're any sort of an animal that not everyone loves, is probably snakes are the most universal. Uh, I've got a lot of snakes here. Everything I've got here today is from British Columbia. Some things came here by accident, other things are supposed to be here. So behind me, I've got a series of jars. They're all nicely lit at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I'll go through some of these guys, just guys, girls, they're, I haven't checked on all of these, but <laughs> there's some absolutely lovely specimens. These are preserved in alcohol. So these are all kinds of specimens that we keep at the museum for scientists to come and study. Every now and again, artists will come in and study something if they want to paint or make a model or a replica. So the material's here for hundreds of years. We've actually got, I brought up a lizard, actually. Let me show that one first. Mm. I like lizards. I'm always into it. And while Gavin's doing that, I'll just say, I can see uh, that some folks are putting in the chat where they're from. Oh, That's great. Nice. Thank you. But if I miss something, Jenny, please go ahead and let me know if there's a question. So please feel free to type questions in the chat. Okay. All right, this is a lizard. This is a pygmy short horned lizard. Now, to give you an idea of how long we keep things at the museum, this was collected in 1898. Wow. So it has been here all that time. I go to and, the side there? Yeah, yeah, it oh, looks, wow. you know, it looks like the day it was caught. Uh -huh. The sad part about this is they haven't been seen, no one's seen a live one in British Columbia since, although there are reports. No one's ever got me a good picture or another specimen. But I'm going to go out looking for these guys. And where else did you say? Did you say where these are from the the this the interior of the province, right down near the United States border. So they're found down in the United States. Um, actually, I think in Oregon they call them snow lizards because they're mm -hmm. up early and they hibernate late. So 
these guys have live babies. Mm. So the females are out basking in the sun to, to help their young develop as quickly as possible. Can you turn so we can see the head, maybe? A little bit more, can you face on? So we'll see. Yeah. Okay. It's kind of funny. I, these guys always look like grumpy old men. <laughs> I love lizards. They're, they're great fun. So this is something that I think people think are is gone from British Columbia. Mm. Um, I'm going to go look for them because I, I got a tip last year that said where to find them. But basically, uh, ever since I was a kid, I've been collecting reptiles and amphibians, and I'm really lucky that I get to actually do this for a living. Um, some of the animals here, like that, that little shorthorn lizard, that's supposed to be in British Columbia, but things like this came here by accident. This is a yellow-bellied sea snake. It's got a beautiful speckled tail. This is a venomous snake. So this is in the same general grouping as, say, cobras. This showed up in ballast water in a ship. And when the ship pumped out the ballast water, this was found down in the hold. What harbor? Uh, it, it, well, I mean, it was deposited here. Oh, I don't know if it was Victoria. actually pumped out here. Oh, wow. But this is a snake that you can find in California, Southern California. So the ship had obviously come up our coast and brought this as a stowaway, a surprise. We've even had rattlesnakes show up here in BC. People drive from, let's say, Arizona, they come back to Canada on holiday, they unpack their recreational vehicle, and there's a rattlesnake on board. <laughs> this is, it's not unusual. Two weeks ago, we got lizards from Florida. They showed up in the truck as well. So it happens all the time. This is a fun snake. Um, th this isn't the exact specimen. This is just happens to be one. It's a California king snake. This is a snake, if you watch James Bond films or where there's supposed to be a venomous snake and they don't want to endanger the actors, quite often they'll use something like this because it looks, I, I suppose people think it looks dangerous. They're totally harmless snakes to us. But uh, one of these was found in Penticton, which is in the interior of British Columbia. So this is a snake that's not normally found in Canada. But again, either a, a pet got loose or it stowed away in some ship, a shipment of crates or boxes. Who knows? Can I, since you, you just mentioned that it's not venomous, <clears throat> is that true that if they're venomous, their head is more triangular? Is that not a way really. to, that's not really no, true? I mean, it's. There are venomous snakes with a really triangular head, uh -huh. but it's not universal. Yeah, okay. Yeah. This cobras, Thank you. for Good. example, okay. do not have ah, triangular Ah, right, head. right. Sea snakes <laughs> do not have triangular uh -huh, head. Right. I think I'd rather be bitten by something with a triangular head than without a triangular head. They're more potent. Now, another funny snake that's found here in BC. They're stumpy. They feel kind of rubbery. It's a rubber boa. So this is a species of boa that comes as far north as Canada. Most people wouldn't think Canada and boas. Certainly not boa constrictors, although those those do actually show up here. Some people dump their pets, by sometimes intentionally, sometimes accidentally. Snakes do get loose. But this is an actual native species to British Columbia. And that color is... They're kind of, yeah, they're, they're more this color. This is, the, the skin has come off here. It's, um, this snake was probably about to shed its skin when it was caught. So some of the scales have slipped off. So normally it would be this sort of almost a peanut buttery to a black color. Yeah, they vary a little bit. And my favorite snake is this one. Much as I like other snakes, this is a night snake. They're very rarely collected here in BC. Now, this is a snake that's harmless to you and I, but when this one was caught, they opened up its stomach and what was left in the stomach was the tail end of a rattlesnake. So this cute little snake, and trust me, I do think snakes are cute. I, I really like them. This snake eats rattlesnakes. So if you see one of these around on your property, this is something you might want to have around if you don't like rattlesnakes. So really cool. Okay. The nice thing about the night snake is like a garter snake. If you have garter snakes wherever you live, have a look at the eye. They've got a round pupil, just like we do. Night snakes have cat's eyes, vertical pupils. So they're really, they, they just, they look like they should be dangerous, but they're not. They're really a pretty little snake. Now. Look sure. at the light coming through your and specimens. I there, love it. Gavin. Yeah, the How beautiful is, is that? <laughs> now, 
since we're doing it's Halloween, and we always talk about you know toads going well with witches. Not all frogs and toads are tiny. This is a western toad. Now that's its tongue sticking out. Sorry about that. Oh, okay. It looks kind of like that, but but they are sizable. And as I mentioned yesterday, I was camping once, and I heard a noise in the bushes, and leaves were rustling. I actually got scared, thinking, "Oh, there might be something coming through." He's through. And I was a little nervous, like it's coming closer. And I talked to my buddy who was in the next tent over. I was like, "Can you hear that?" And he said, "Yeah, it sounds big." Turns out it was just a very big toad crawling through the leaves. Making so a lot of noise. I got faked out <laughs> and freaked out by a toad. We do have a question there. Are you able to put it down on the white? On the is that okay? Or but is, yeah, just yeah. we might be able to get a, just a little. Oh, getting a maybe lot not. Frost, probably. Yeah, yeah, the, the yeah. light of the sun. Um, yeah, somebody was just asking. I think that was Jenny asking. What was the liquid that the toad is in in the in the jar? So all of these specimens, because they've been here a long time. We've always, historically, we've used isopropyl alcohol or rubbing alcohol, mm -hmm. and that preserves them. So we originally, this is, it's a two-step process to preserve these guys. There's a process we call fixing, where it's dunked into formaldehyde, and formaldehyde locks up the tissues so that it looks lifelike. And then the alcohol preserves it for long time, long periods, stops bacteria and fungi from growing and destroying the specimen. So we don't store in formaldehyde long term. It gets acidic and wrecks the specimen. It's dripping. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we can see the belly. Yeah. Big chubby toad. Yeah. Western toads get to a good size. Not all toads get this big. But there are bigger ones in North America. Right. Yeah, I, I do like toads. I, uh, I mean, they're... Who doesn't like a toad? I, I, would, I would love to have these in my garden. So <laughs> far, I haven't seen one. And the other animal that's quite often mentioned around Halloween and witches and things is the newt. Eye ah. of newt. And this is our uh, rough skin newt. So this is a native species here in British Columbia. When they're alive, they're chocolate brown, not too far off that color. But the belly is bright orange. Mm. So on a Halloween theme, you can't beat this. <laughs> Pumpkin orange belly, brown back, and it has that eye of newt connect connection. And so it um, fades while you while yeah, in, the, in the jar. Yeah, they do it. All color fades in the jars. If, if we had a snake that was bright red, it would lose that color over time. Uh, newts are hilarious. They're they're <laughs> um, around here. If you flip a log, you'll find them here and there. They're you don't see them every day, but always a treat when you're out hiking and you find a newt or something. Mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's always a high point to a hike. Love newts. There's another newt just south of us in Washington that's just appeared. It's uh, about that long, so not quite as big. The adults are olive green with black polka dots and then bright red spots down the back and then a yellow belly. They're quite colorful. But they have a young face called an EFT, E-F-T is how it's spelled, that is pumpkin orange with red spots. And they, they migrate across land. So In Washington State. In Washington, just south of British Columbia. Okay. So maybe in the next 30 years, we could mm. end up with the So is that the only species of newt we have? The only newt in British Columbia. In BC. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Ah. The eastern newt is probably our next closest newt in Canada, and that's right on the border between Manitoba and Ontario, so mm -hmm. in the center of the country. Mm -hmm. Now, Gavin, you showed us a lizard, and you're showing us a newt. What's the difference between newts and lizards, and salamanders and lizards? Well, newts are amphibians. Their skin is porous, so if you leave this guy out on the counter, if it was alive, no water to be found, it would dry out. Mm. They cannot stop water from escaping through their skin. Lizards, scaly skin, they lay eggs that have a shell. These guys do not lay eggs with a hard shell. Not really a hard shell. Lizard, lizard eggs are more leathery, but these guys lay eggs, not unlike a frog's egg. It'll be encased in jelly. Uh, lizards have a, a, a an egg that effectively looks like a chicken's egg, but smaller and leathery. Okay. So, and, and of course, lizards are reptiles. So yeah, okay. they're, they're quite different. It's really funny. I get people phoning me up saying they've seen a lizard, but it's moving really slowly. <laughs> Nine times out of 10, it's one of these, and they they just don't know a lizard from a salamander or a newt. And that was a question from the chat. So thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, I think we're going to move on. Okay, though. Unless...
But I think what, well, what I will say is, are there any questions before we leave this area? We're actually going to have time for questions at the, at the end. Yeah. <clears throat> I've got a Unless really there's snake. Oh, I've got a rattlesnake yeah. here. Let's have a look at that. And then if yes, if there are any specific questions for Gavin, you could ask them now. So there's a rattlesnake and you can see its nostril is here. And then just below it is a pit that detects heat. So a rattlesnake can bite you in the dark. Even if it can't see you, it can see you using the heat detector. And these snakes, even though they're preserved, would still have their fangs in place. So you don't stick your finger in the mouth. Mm. And the only nice thing is the chemicals we use to preserve them will also preserve the venom. So you can't get a venomous bite from a pickled rattlesnake. You can? You cannot. Cannot. No, it is. This okay. is safe to handle. I just don't want to get jabbed by a tooth because they're still large. Yeah. But you can see there's that triangular shaped head. Right. Basically, they've got right. a very broad head. We know they are venomous. And so this is from the Southern Okan Okanagan. Yeah, area. this one is, just a sec, let me look. Kaliden, yeah, in BC. Okay. Now I saw there was a couple of questions there and I missed that little, the one about migration. Jenny, could you read that one out? Yeah, so there's a question of how far can toads migrate? <laughs> oh, good question. I really don't know that off the top of my head. That's a great question. Um, well, the storybook toads have suitcases and things. They can yeah. probably migrate further. Yeah. Yeah, that, that I actually don't know. I actually work with, more with reptiles than with the amphibians, but yeah, you've got me on that's that a, That's a really good question. I am research. <laughs> Nicely done. <laughs> Thank you for that question. What is the scariest specimen in your collection? Oh, good so Halloween cool. question from Chris. Thank you. Scariest mm. specimen. I think in the museum's collection of, of vertebrates, considering how people worry about bats, I think our bats are probably what freak the most people out. Mm -hmm. There are people who get scared about birds fluttering around their heads. So some people get a little upset with crows and things like that. But I think more people are a little jittery about bats when it comes to, in the vertebrates collection. So uh, Joel will show you some other things that probably will get more people jumpy. Um, but yeah, I think for us, it's bats. Okay. Yeah, and there's no real need for it. All of the bats here, they're small. They wouldn't. They, they all of the superstitions are false. They're they're quite harmless things. In fact, they're very beneficial to have around. I love having them in my garden because I see them all the time. Right. Yeah. Not spooky, scary. Not spooky. No, scary. no. Okay. Not thank to a scientist. To a scientist. <laughs> Thanks so much, Gavin. But you're going to come with us down yeah. to Joel's area. So I think what we're going to do is turn around. We're going to we're going to follow Joel. I'm just going to put these away. Yes, put excellent away. idea. I'm going to follow <laughs> Joel. Do you want to say a quick hi? Hi, I'm Joel Gibson. I'm the curator of entomology. And we're going to go down there, and I'll show you what that means and other neat stuff we have to look at. Okay, let's go. Excellent. I'm going to follow you, and hopefully we will stay connected. I think the stairwell we're going down is very good it's, for internet connection, isn't it? And it's the fun um, spiral staircase, okay, which is very fun. Excellent. You get to go all through the different parts of the collection back here. Okay. Mm -hmm, spiral, I'm gonna see if it can, oh yeah, love it. So down here go. is the entomology collection, which is insects and spiders, but also centipedes and millipedes and, you know, scorpions, other things that are very similar to insects and spiders. But most of what we have are insects and spiders. And we have a really big collection, mostly things from British Columbia, but there's thousands and thousands of species and over a million different specimens. And when we talk about a specimen, that means one thing. So when Gavin was talking about one snake or one toad, that's one specimen. So for us, one specimen might be one butterfly or one dragonfly. So when we say there's a million specimens, that means there's a million things here. Now, we preserve and store things a little bit different than Gavin. We do have some things that are preserved in alcohol, like he had, and we're going to look at those in a second. But a lot of what we have is actually pinned, and that's a better way for insects, because when they're dried out, they can last 150 years, like the specimens Gavin was showing you. And for us, that means them to be pinned. And I'm going to start with something that is not creepy or crawly, 
but it is nice and it is Halloween color. So let's start. And Joel, before you even do that, someone has commented on your awesome Halloween shirt. Oh, that I, is fantastic. I love Thank you. Movies, Thank so you for why. that. <laughs> <laughs> so if we look at here, Halloween colors, black and orange, right? right? That's a pretty good guess. And if you don't have a Halloween costume, you just wear some black and orange, maybe something with a pumpkin on it, you're set. So when I think of that, I think of Monarch Butterflies. And this is the sort of thing we have in our collection, which is pin specimens. Now, yes, these aren't alive anymore. They were al alive before they were collected. And when we do collect them, they're important because then they become really important, valuable data for our collection, which we can use. And monarch butterflies are found all around North America. And they're neat because they migrate. And a lot of people that live in different parts of North America study where exactly they migrate. And a lot of them will migrate down to central Mexico and then fly back up into the Midwestern US and into Southern Canada. Some will migrate down California. So the ones that we get here will usually fly back down to California in the winter and then a new population comes up in the spring. So monarch butterflies amazing, are really neat. Amazing animals, yeah. They are amazing. <laughs> and they're Halloween colors, so that's good. <laughs> Thank you for that. But they're not creepy or crumb. They're, they're pretty. I don't know if anyone that hasn't said it, like butterflies are nice and pretty. <laughs> so let's go and look at some more creepy crawling things. It's a good thing we're following Joel. It's a maze in here. You sometimes can be lost if you're not careful. So one other thing we like to think about is, well, okay, let's start with moths. Because moths are like butterflies, very, very similar and related. But a big difference with moths is they fly at night instead of flying during the day. And you think, okay, that's kind of interesting. They fly at night, they eat different things. But when something flies at night and isn't as reliant on seeing things, they don't tend to be as colorful. So moths usually don't have the bright, beautiful colors you see. Usually they tend to be drab colors like this kind of, just kind of brown, even if they are big. The exception is if you kind of see poking out here, a lot of moths will have little flashes of color in their back wings, and they'll actually flash these sometimes to scare things off as a little bright flash of color. But then they can cover it up and be kind of dark and hard to see at night. So if you see something flying around at night, it's probably a moth, um, oh, unless it's a bat. But if it's something you think it's an insect and it's flying around, it's probably a moth. It's not going to be a butterfly. Good rule of thumb. I find moths really neat. And actually, unless you want to sit there in the dark and try to find them, Best way is just wait in the morning and you'll see them on the side of your wall or underneath a the light. They'll kind of sit there after they get tired of flying around all night before they go to bed. Kind of like vampires. They fly around all night and then they go to bed during the day. Nice Halloween similarity. Um, there was a question about monarchs. And I again, I only got the first bit. Oh. Jenny, can you read it out? Yes. Um, the question was, can one individual monarch migrate all the way to Mexico? That is a really good question because... When they do studies on it, they'll usually try to mark individuals just to see how far they fly. And what they found is it's usually one individual that flies all the way down, but it's not the same individuals that come back. So they'll fly down, spend the winter, then they'll have babies. The babies will grow and start to fly back. And even in some of them, they'll only fly part of the way back. So it's usually like two or three generations. So when you see some in Mexico, the next ones that are there next winter are probably their grandkids or their great grandkids. Because one generation doesn't ever fly both directions, which is very strange because you're like, wait, no one has ever made the full trip, but they still go to the same places. And when they mark them, they'll find they'll always go back to the same you know location in Mexico, sometimes even the same trees year after year. It's amazing. Great question. Now, here... When you want to talk about creepy and crawly, one of the first things people think about, and something that a lot of people don't particularly like, but I can understand that, is spiders. And I like them because that's part of my job and my training is I learned to love insects and spiders and all these things. And I, I get excited, but I can understand why some people don't like them. And I got to tell you, even I don't like it when, particularly when I'm about to get in the shower and you see a spider and you see it crawling, you kind of go, Whoa. and I think my reason, I've thought about this a lot, and I think it's because spiders move in a really different way. 
And it's not even like a butterfly, which is like fluttering. Butterflies used to be called flutterflies because they just kind of flutter around and it's nice. And even if you see a bee, it's kind of buzzing on purpose and it's kind of understandable. Spiders either move really, really fast or they kind of move sideways and they move in a way that's very unusual. And I think that is what it tends to throw a lot of people off. It's similar to crabs, except crabs you don't tend to see in your bathroom. But spiders, the way they move kind of makes, and it is because they're crawling and because they're creeping. And I think that is a reason. But I found that people that just study them and really learn to love them and know about them, if you watch it, then you're like, oh, I like that they move so weird. That's because they have unusual legs or because they have a different body shape. And I want to know about all the different types of spiders. And they really learn to love them. Like a lot of things, the more you learn about it, the more you love it. So spiders, if they're odd, take as much time as you can to watch them, as much as you're comfortable with, even if that's just in a book or videos online, to watch how they move. And I, I'm telling you, the longer you look at them, you start to see, oh, I kind of find it interesting the way they move. They are fascinating. But we do also keep things in ethanol, just like Gavin does. Because spiders in particular, like the insects are fine when they dry out. They will tend to stay like that for hundreds of years. Spiders just get a little bit too dry and crispy. So that if they stay, like this is okay, as long as we keep it in this basket and don't move it. But if you ever tried to pin it or pick it up, pieces would start to fall off. So spiders tend to be kept in ethanol just because all the pieces stay together because they're just too fragile, which you find interesting that spiders can be so scary, but they're really, really fragile mm. when you think about it. And speaking of fragile, they're, uh, they're webs. There was a question about spider webs. Again, Jenny, could you read it out? Yeah. So what type of spider web is most effective, such as is it the circular unified one or the more randomized one? Sometimes you'll see in like a forest or something. It's a really, really good question because one of the ways that people that study spiders know about them is sort of their behavior and the shape of their web is included in their behavior. And different groups of spiders have different types of webs. And some that are called the orb weavers, and orb, if you know, that word means sphere or globe. So those ones tend to be like the perfectly circular ones. And there's a whole group of spiders that all basically have similar ones. But even those, if you look carefully, you'll see like, the number of spokes or how dense it is, or does it have four anchor points or three anchor points, but they'll all be kind of orb webs. Then there's like the ones you mentioned that are sort of just the random ones. I think of this in your basement when you see cobwebs, they never tend to have a shape. They're just kind of strands sticking to things. That's a style as well. Um, some spiders just have a sheet on the ground. They'll just have a bunch of webbing on the ground that may or may not be sticky, but that they can stand next to it and they can tell when something walks on it so that they can jump out and grab it. So it's just sort of not even a sticky web. It's more like just a detector web. And then some will make, a, a lot of spiders make a little cave for themselves that they can hide in, whether that's part of a web or not. And then trapdoor spiders will make a little cave for themselves with a web on top and they'll even stick leaves and things so it looks camouflaged, but they can pop open the door and jump out and grab things. So those are trapdoor spiders. And it's actually one of the ways you classify groups of spiders is <laughs> What kind of web does it make? And each one is just good at what they use, you know? And if you, it's funny that if you took an orb web spider and put them in a different type of web, they wouldn't know what to do. This web is built wrong. So it's kind of like you get used to your house and you get used to the tools and stuff you use. If you give someone different tools, they don't know how to work with it anymore. So spiders have the best web for them because those are the ones they know how to do. And you remind me, Jenny, I don't know if you can find it or Chris, but on the learning portal on that spider content that you just posted, I think on the watch page, there's a really nice animated video about Pacific folding door spiders yes. and shows exactly how they, how they live in their, their there's little, some yeah. Great really. videos of those. So people, especially cameras have gotten really good that people are able to get super close up shots and just kind of leave it for a while to be able to see it. Cause before there's always people who are like, I think I know how spiders move. I think I know what ants are doing. But now that cameras have gotten really good, you can actually watch the footage of what they're doing. And they'll watch how a spider builds all the parts of its web with like a time-lapse photo and see how it'll do one part at a time and fill it in. So Amazing. that's interesting. Amazing. Very. Any, okay, what else have you got for us? Well, there's also, there's some questions. Like these are not BC specimens, mm -hmm. but um, if you were going to think about sort of the 
I, what I think of the only spiders that are actually scary would be tarantulas. But even then, they're mostly scary for small birds, other insects, sometimes small frogs. Um, there are spiders that will eat frogs, that will eat small birds, bird-eating tarantulas. But these ones are not around here. They tend to be more Central America, South America. There's some African ones as well. Um, and even these aren't that dangerous. They're not that likely to bite you. And actually, the far more likely thing is for the hairs that are on them. If you look very closely on them, you can see they look kind of fuzzy. I had someone tell me that they have a tarantula and they named it Fluffy, uh, which I can understand because it has all of these long hairs on it. And these long hairs protect them, kind of keep them warm, but they protect them because, and this is the part that's kind of dangerous if you have a tarantula, is they can really irritate your skin. And those little hairs will get stuck in your fingers and sometimes they'll even get infected. And it's that's by far the more dangerous thing, not them biting you, but all of the little hairs. And there's other insects that have that too. There's a lot of caterpillars that'll have those hairs that look kind of fuzzy until you touch them. And then it just never goes away. It's stuck in your finger for days and days and is really annoying. So, but those are all protected. It's so that something won't eat it. So a tarantula, its most scary part is because it's scared of being eaten. Right. Which everything's kind of scary yeah. of being eaten. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. Well, I, what about, um, I'm sure somebody's probably thinking this or typing this right now. What about the black widow spider? You hear about that's a really, that's a venomous one in British Columbia. It is in British Columbia, it is venomous. Um, it doesn't tend to be venomous enough to be a problem to people. I'm sure it wouldn't feel good if you got bitten by one, but it's not something that you think of as life-threatening. So like Gavin, when people ask us, like, oh, is there something that's so venomous it could kill you in BC? The answer is usually, well, no, not really. There are things that are venomous. They're not very serious. Um, and so the likelihood of somebody actually getting it. But, but black widow spiders you can find around here. You can go and see them. They tend to be small. They're venomous just enough for them to eat grasshoppers and wasps, which is usually what they catch in their web and they eat them. So, but they're not really threatening to people. I had a, a professor once when I was learning that said, you know, when you go out in the woods, what percent of things are dangerous to you? And the answer is always like way less than 1%. And it doesn't really matter where you go in the world. There's really not that much out there that is more dangerous than, than people. <laughs> so it uh, is not that uh, dangerous. Not to say that black beetles aren't venomous and they are here, but they're really not. And they're usually more worried about us than than we are about You're them. way bigger than we are. If you want to, exactly. if you think of Black Widow as scary, imagine you were its size and you were, and it was your size. Yeah. That would be scary. <laughs> <laughs> we have it exactly. And there was a question um, from Chris. How do you collect spiders, Joel? Spiders, there's really good people that are very good at it, are very patient. They will go and look for places spiders are very likely to be. So under rocks, under logs, and you can often find them there. You look for the webs and kind of wait. Sometimes they will tickle the webs to see if something will come out and then grab them off of it. That works very well. Sometimes there's spiders that are so small and there's over 900 species of spiders in the province, but most of them are super tiny, like smaller than your fingernail. So those are not easy to find, even if you're really talented and really patient. So often what they'll do is to have traps, whether it's bowls of liquid and they just kind of leave them for a few days and hope something will fall into them. Or what they'll do is they'll sift material. They'll get a whole bunch of dried leaves, moss, and they'll just sift it, put it under lights and see what will crawl out of it. And it's amazing how many different types of spiders they'll find that way that they didn't even know were there because they're so small and so hidden. So that is actually the funny thing is sometimes it's really hard to go out and find spiders, except your back. <laughs> except when you're not looking so you don't isn't, isn't that always the way well thank you very much Joel and I was just looking at our time here um and just so I'm bringing Gavin back into view here so if anybody has questions for for either Gavin or Joel you could we still have a couple of minutes here and did I see the question there Jenny was about having spiders in the home is it good to have spiders in the home is that yeah. what it was yeah, is it good to have spiders in your home? If you see a spider, should you leave it or should you take it outside? What is the best bet? Well, to be honest, it's not hard to take it outside. A cup and a piece of paper and it can be outside and the odds are it won't find its way back in. So you can always do that if you want to be friendly. If you want to be really friendly, you can just pretend you don't see it and let it live in your house and hope it doesn't <laughs> come across you again. 
but you can do that too because they're really not threatening. Um, people don't ever get so many spiders in their house that it's a problem that that never happens. Um, but if you really don't. Oh. 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 Oh, we lost. Sorry. Her. Sorry. Oh. There we are. I don't know what happened. Okay. Sorry. I don't know what, what you missed of Joel. We were muted for a sec. Um, Spiders eat silverfish and that's good. Oh, okay. <laughs> that is good to know. That is good to know. Okay. Sarah, oh, you're going to have to read it out. It's getting cut out. Can you read oh, that Oh, yes, out for, me? for sure. So Sarah on Facebook asks, what's your favorite species to study? That could go to either one of you. You go first. Yeah. <laughs> well, Jill's thinking. Favorite species to study. Well, I've, I've spent a lot of time working on wall lizards recently, but I think I'm going to switch to the western fence lizard. Three have been found in British Columbia since 2020, and they're found just south of us in Washington State. And they're a lizard I had when I was a kid, so I'm kind of nostalgic. They got bright blue on the throat, blue patches down the belly, and when they're doing their territorial displays, they do these ridiculous push-ups. <laughs> so how can you not want to study something that's so ridiculous? And that's new coming up in BC? Yeah. That's yeah. Like sort of, okay, moving a species on the move. Research. Okay, interesting. Joel? Well, can't narrow it down to one species, but I can narrow it down to a group of species. And I never studied them a lot, but I've gotten to work with some people here that were really good at studying robber flies. And it's kind of funny because I think of something scary. Robber flies are scary if you're another insect because they're flies that can fly around and grab insects in the air and eat them. So. A lot of them would be called bee grabbers or tarantula hawks, where they can actually grab, not tarantula hawks, but they will be wasp hawks, where they can actually grab wasps and eat them in the air. So I think of robber flies as being very scary, but also there's hundreds of species of them. And some of them are very tiny. Some of them are big and look like bumblebees. There's a photograph of them here. These are robber flies. And they tend to have these really neat mustaches. That's how you recognize them. They have a big mustache out front. So I, I've, I've come to really like robber flies lately. Okay. And I think there are some robber fly photos and articles on the what has six legs on the learning portal there, Jenny. Um, and I saw that question. Again, I missed it. There was another question. Yeah, that we have a couple of questions. One is, what's the difference between a salamander and a newt? Ah. Ah. <laughs> Well, I mean, the easy answer is it's a common name, but they are actually in different families. So we group we group animals, plants, fungi, all, all life into categories. So there are families for each group of reptile and amphibian. And so there's several families for salamanders and there's salamandridae, which is hilarious, is the family for newts. Ah. Makes no sense, does it? Ah. So we've got two speak. We've got several families of, of salamanders here in British Columbia, but our newt is in salamandridae. So yeah, they're they're different families of tailed amphibians. That's really it. Thank you, Gavin. Ooh. Okay, J Jenny, um, go ahead. There was another question. It was actually my question: Is what is as a species? Is it more effective to be venomous or poisonous? What is a better thing ah. to be? Uh well, if you're poisonous, you have to get bitten to make your point. If you're venomous, you're the one doing the biting. This is true. All in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> yes. I like that one too, that if you're poisonous, you want everyone to know you're poisonous. But if you're venomous, you kind of don't want anyone to know you're venomous. Yeah. yeah. So that's a big difference too, is the nice thing is in animals, whether it's insects or invertebrates, if something is poisonous, it's usually really obvious because they're bright red and big stripes and something near it. Or it's something pretending to be poisonous and has the color, but isn't poisonous. Yeah, I was going to say there are quite a lot of insects that pretend to be poisonous when they actually yes. are not. <laughs> Does That's that ever right. happen with amphibians or anything in your collection, Gavin? Um, no, I think our newt has the bright orange belly as a showy, a showy uh, display to say, look, I'm toxic, Don't don't eat me. Um, toads don't, on the other hand, so they're toxic, but they're camouflaged. So there's there's kind of the oddball on that one. Um, all of our snakes don't show any crazy colors to say I'm venomous, stay away from me. So some of our garter snakes, like they can have bright red stripes, 
but they're harmless. So it's not even not even any sort of coloration to 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 trick you into thinking they're venomous. So yeah, mm -hmm. most of our stuff it, it's pretty drab here. <laughs> pretty pretty well, and speaking of tricking, I see there was a Halloween question. Yes. There was a Halloween question. If there was a zombie apocalypse, which of our collection would do the best? Whoa. I don't know if that means do the best as in the best surviving it or the best as being if zombies. If all the specimens came to life. If all the specimens came to life. Let's make that the question. If yes. all the specimens came to life, which collection would survive a zombie apocalypse? That's easy. Your collection. It's just numbers. By weight of numbers. <laughs> yes. Millions. <laughs> yeah, it's just millions and millions of them. And even when you thought you got all of the zombie spiders out of there, there'd be a whole bunch more of them. Yeah. And then you forgot about all the zombie ants that would come spilling out of one cabinet. And then zombie beetles that would come crawling. So I think the insects, there's just so many of them if they came to life. That would that would yeah. actually yeah. scare me. Yeah. Yeah. Terrifying. All right. On that, how is that the I think that was the last of the questions, Jenny? Correct. I think that that is a fantastic way to end because that was terrifying. I'm just gonna switch us around and we can all say bye-bye. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. Happy Halloween. And I hope Thanks, that you are less fearful of all the creep, crawl, and slithering things in our province. Thank you for posting that, Jenny. So there again are the names of uh, our biologists, our curators here today with emails. In case you have questions, follow-up questions for them, you are welcome to contact them. Um, and yeah, thank you for your time. And thanks, everybody. Uh, we are going to post, this is being recorded, we are going to post it to our YouTube channel. So thanks for joining us. And thanks everyone in face, Facebook land joining us as well. Okay, happy Halloween. Bye everybody. <laughs>